Hi guys, this is Sean from Fastune here, and I'm here today to talk to you about a very important part of our engine management regime, and something that a lot of people are aware exists, don't really understand how it works. What is that? It's your rev limiter. Now, rev limiter seems pretty self-explanatory. It prevents the revs, your RPMs, your engine speed, from exceeding a certain limit. We usually determine that limit by what the braking point is of some part of the engine, be it we're going to float the valves, uh, we're going to break a rod, we're out of injector at a certain point. It may also be set just based on the fact that we don't make any more power past a certain point, so we really don't need any more revs. And more revs tends to mean more wear and tear on your engine. Uh, the piston's going up and down faster, we have more wear on the rings, more heat, so we don't want to use any more RPMs than we have to. Now, in the old days, back before many of us were born, 50s and 60s even, uh, we saw a lot of cars, in fact most cars, had no rev limiter. But because we were running distributors and carburetors, there wasn't really an easy way to implement that. So it was up to the owner of the vehicle, the driver, to make sure that they didn't rev it too far. Now, because of the cam profiles and the nature of the engine, typically the car would stop making power, the engine would stop making power, and would, would not continue to rev long before you'd risk floating the valves or breaking something. But as you began to build the vehicle for more high performance, put a bigger cam in, more aggressive carburetors, you began to run into issues where you, it was possible to over rev the engine and nothing was going to stop you but your ability to watch your, your tachometer and your ability to shift quickly. So today though, we use rev limiters for a variety of things. We can actually implement rev limiters uh, in stages. We can use them as a launch control methodology. We can even use them to assist us in making shifts quicker. And there are a variety of ways we can do it. We can do it with an ignition cut. We simply cut the spark. We can do it with a fuel cut. We turn off the injectors. We can do it by closing the throttle on a drive-by-wire uh, throttle car. We can even partially implement a rev limiter uh, by altering our cam timing at high RPM to basically make the engine not want to rev so much anymore. Uh, and all these ways are valid ways of doing things, but there are some important limitations and some important side effects that we really need to understand on rev limiters and that really makes a difference in what we choose as our methodology for limiting the RPM of an engine. So let's begin by talking about uh, a very common car that we tune a lot of, and that's a Subaru. Uh, Subarus actually use a couple different methodologies to do rev limiting. The first, for example, is we have a standard uh, uh, fuel cut rev limiter, okay? And it's usually under here under limits, and we have a rev limit, in this case 7,100 RPM. Now, the first thing you can notice here is that we actually have a hysteresis. The rev limiter turns on at 7,100 RPM, but the revs the spark does, or the fuel does not turn back on until we're below 7,000. So that's called hysteresis, so that we're not rapidly turning the fuel on and off right at 7,100. Why do we need a hysteresis there? Well, what happens is if we simply start turning the fuel off above 7,100 and on below 7,100, if we're right at that point bouncing back and forth, what's going to happen is we may end up with some fuel events that aren't quite matched up. We may inject fuel where we don't really want it. We can end up with some uneven firing on the engine, we might even end up with a lean condition in some places. So by making sure that we turn the, the fuel off above 7100, but don't turn it back on until below, or below 7000, we get a slower rev limiter. So that's, you're going to be more of a, a slow bum, 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 as opposed to say a, a race quality rev limiter where it's a very fast, rapid uh, sputtering or popping. Uh, but that's safe. And we have to do it that way with the fuel cut because when we're cutting fuel, we're, we're doing something that can potentially cause a lean condition. Now, a lot of engine management systems or a lot of manufacturers, OEMs, use a fuel cut as their primary methodology. And the reason for that is uh, uh, primarily for emissions purposes and the, the ma making sure you have a good lifespan on your emissions control equipment. It's far better to do a spark cut, in my opinion, or a throttle cut, if you can, uh, because obviously fuel cut has some issues associated with it. We have to have some histories just to protect the motor. But if we just do a spark cut, what happens there now is that we have something that behaves kind of like a misfire. In other words, we've injected the fuel, but we have no spark. When we have a misfire, we've injected fuel, but we don't light off the mixture because we didn't have enough spark energy or we had an improper mixture or something happened. Now, misfires are very, very bad from an emission standpoint. We get a ton of unburnt fuel going through the exhaust. That obviously creates an emission spike. But even more importantly, from an OEM standpoint, that unburnt fuel is going straight to your catalytic converter. Now, catalytic converters can deal with a rich mixture, a lean mixture, but when you have completely uncombusted fuel, not something that's been through a reaction, just a, you know, a rich mixture in the chamber, that fuel is going to spike the temperature on the catalytic converter very, very rapidly and very, very high. And if you have a bad misfire event, or if you're riding, say, a rev limiter where you're on an ignition cut and you have a bunch of fuel going to the cat, you're going to spike those cat temperatures very, very high. And when you spike the cat temperatures above a certain point, you damage the 
and you do enough damage to the cat with a converter, then the substrate's going to break down or it's going to lose effectiveness. And OEM manufacturers have to have catalytic converters that are basically warranted to work for 100 to 150,000 miles minimum. So they can't afford any kind of misfires, which is why misfire detection is so important for OEM uh, like engine management systems. But if we have a catless car or run an aftermarket engine management system, then we can choose some other methodologies. Now, one of the other methodologies that does work okay, even for emissions, control, emissions controlled cars, is to do a throttle cut. And what we can do here is look at uh, our requested torque here. This is a, uh, let me give a better map here on this one. This is for a, an STI here, by the way. So we have several different uh, throttle maps that are selectable. But what you see here is this is a, uh, the top line here, the x-axis, is your accelerator pedal angle. Okay, so we demand, we ask for 31% throttle, we ask for 90% throttle. That's what the top axis is. And the y-axis is basically our RPMs. So what you see is that we're actually able to tell uh, the ECU, the base point of throttle angle, we're asking for a bunch of torque here, but even at full throttle, we're asking for less and less torque as we get up near the rev limiter. And then, remember, our rev, our rev limiter is at 7,100 RPM. Between 7,000 and 7,100, we go from asking from pretty substantial amount of torque, uh, approximately 250 pound-feet of torque, to asking for basically 20 pound-feet of torque, barely anything, just enough to barely keep the throttle open to keep the engine running. And what that does is, as we close that throttle, the engine acceleration slows, and so there's less of a need for us to get into a fuel cut methodology. And so this is nice. This is basically really a primary methodology. The fuel cut is a secondary methodology to keep the engine from revving too high. And if you have the ability to do drive, if you're doing drive by wire on your car, if it's a car made after typically 2006, 2007 for most manufacturers, then if you have access to the factory ECU or you have a good standalone system that's controlling the drive by wire throttle body, you can use it to basically give yourself a preliminary rev limiter to slow the acceleration down and to keep the driver from getting in to the hard rev limit on, say, the fuel cut. Uh, because you're not going to see most factory engine management systems are not going to be running an ignition cut. But what if we are running an ignition cut? Uh, what if we want to do something uh, with that? Well, let's say, for example, we're using a, a, a standalone system like the AEM EMS, the Series 2, the, this is the software we're using here right here. We have the ability to choose a fuel cut, an ignition cut, and also a retard rev limit. So now we've already talked about the fuel cut. Ignition cut is, is the same thing. We're just cutting spark though instead of fuel. So we're creating a kind of a misfire event, but it's gonna be much safer for the motor. Not good if you have a catalytic converter. And it's kind of self-explanatory, uh, but we also have the ability to do a retard rev limit. Now AEM gives us the ability to set things up in a variety of ways. We actually get to choose the type of cut that we want. Uh, we have, a, in this case, four levels. In some cases, you have as many as 10. Uh, whereas a full cut is going to basically uh, uh, go ahead and give us a, a, a full timing retard of 10 degrees at our retard limit. And when we hit our ignition cut, our fuel cut is going to shut everything off. But if we were to go down, and it's not going to allow any over rev at all. But if we go down to, say, a medium cut, though, it's going to start by uh, doing what we call a 50% cut. So it's going to start pulling... Uh, dropping cylinders at 50% at our target rev limit, and then if we exceed 250 RPM over that rev limit, then it's going to do a full cut. So what this does is starts trying to pull out cylinders, drop cylinders, cut timing, before, and, and, and then if we actually overshoot, then we're going to get a hard cut. So it's trying to avoid the hard cut. And you can do it all the way down to what we call a soft cut, which is going to be uh, only a 25% initial cut, and then allow up to 400 RPM of overshoot. But the more important thing here is this retard rev limit. This is kind of important. AEM has, has kind of always given us kind of a mixed message about this. They didn't really recommend it on some of the earlier systems, the AEM uh, version 1. But uh, what this does, if we use it, is it allows the ECU to start pulling out timing before we ever get to our rev limit. So in this case, you'll notice, first of all, that we have our ignition cut before our fuel cut. So we're, we're cutting the ignition first, which is safer. But if we wanted to, we could also implement a retard rev limit and say maybe 8,800 RPM. And in doing so, now once we get to 8,800 RPM, the ECU is going to start pulling out timing. And so it's going to slow the rate of the acceleration down of the engine. We may even get some misfires and some sputtering before it gets to do a hard cut. So that's going to encourage the driver to shift before he ever gets to that hard cut. By the way, you'll also notice that we also have a boost cut here, which is another form of rev limiter. That's more of a protection thing, but if we exceed a certain boost level, we'll also get a fuel cut um, to prevent the car from boosting any further. Now, this concept of a retard rev limit is actually very, very useful, and you'll see it implemented more and more in standalones. Even something like a mega squirt, which is uh, historically kind of a do-it-yourself ECU, and it's become more popular. Now some shops are, are building them and offering them for select applications. 
offers the ability to do a retard rev limit. And it'll, it'll ask you when to begin the retard rev limit, when to implement the hard rev limit, and how much timing to begin pulling out when you implement the retard rev limit. And so you can use that to determine the nature of the cut. The more timing you pull out, the, the harder that retard rev limit is going to be. It's going to be more aggressive. If you gradually pull timing out there, then it's going to be softer, and you may get the driver to, to, to actually shift the motor before you ever get close to the hard rev limiter. And that can be very, very useful, for example, in, say, a road racing situation where you the driver needs a very, very smooth limiter. He doesn't want to get onto a, a hard limiter, which could upset the chassis, especially if the car is heavily loaded in the corner and they're accelerating. Now, what if you don't have the ability, though? What if a retard rev limit is not built into your engine management system? Well, you can still do something about that. And what we like to do there is we just basically implement our own retard rev limiter. Now, this is a map for a, a Honda S2000 running a, a supercharged setup. And one of the problems you have with superchargers, especially centrifugal superchargers, is they don't like to be rapidly accelerated and decelerated. You know, when we get into a rev limiter on a turbocharger, the turbocharger simply stops accelerating and begins to slow down. It's not a big deal. You may get some little pulses that prevent it from slowing down too much as the engine cycles on and off, but it's not a big deal. But if we have a centrifugal supercharger, which is driven by a belt, and we hit a rev limiter, in this case almost 9,000 RPM, and then it cuts down to 80, 100, and then back to 9,000, we're rapidly accelerating and decelerating the supercharger. And on some superchargers, that can cause breakage of the shaft. So in order to avoid that, what can we do? Well, the best thing to do is to begin doing a kind of an artificial retard rev limit. But since we don't have the ability to do that on this ECU, this is a Honda and a K-Pro, what we do is we're going to set our rev limiter, in this case, we set it to 9,100 RPM. But if you look at our timing graph here, 8,800, we have full timing. But at 9,000, we've pulled out about 25 degrees of timing there. Okay, so but we, even though the hard rev limit is at 91, our fuel cut, we begin pulling out timing after 8800, so we should get, basically, it'll never make it to 91 under most circumstances. And what that does is then is we begin to get a misfire condition, the engine won't accelerate anymore, but we're not actually causing it to rapidly bounce back and forth, so it's a softer cut. And we've simply done this by implementing this in the timing tables. Now, be aware again, doing something like this is not good for your catalytic converter. It is going to spike your exhaust gas temperatures. You're going to be dumping fuel into the exhaust. Um, on a race car, it's pretty cool. You get some nice flame shooting out of the exhaust, but it's not good for a street car with a catalytic converter. So be aware of the risk you're taking in doing this. You're not going to damage the, damage the engine, but you could damage some of your emissions equipment if you still have it. But it gives us a useful tool for trying to protect the motor as well as how we implement the rev limiter. So in conclusion, you've got a lot of different options for rev limiters. You can do a fuel cut. You can do an ignition cut. You can do an ignition retard. You can do a throttle cut. All these are options. Some of them you can even implement even if the ECU doesn't support that particular cut. If you have control of the throttle tables, you can implement your own throttle cut, even if it doesn't already exist. If you have control of the ignition tables, you can begin to implement some sort of retard cut on a vehicle as well, even if retard rev limiters are not implemented as a standalone feature. So just be aware of what the car is going to be used for, whether or not you have emissions equipment on the car, uh, what the driver wants, and what other limitations, for example, centrifugal supercharger, do we have to deal with and make sure that we're protecting when we're, when we're deciding what kind of rev limit we're going to use. All right, that's it for today. I'm Sean Church. This is uh, Fast Tune, and this is your tidbit on how to use rev limiters on modern engine management systems.